2007 was a very big year for the gaming industry. We had a ton of titles that are today seen as some of the best games of all time. We had titles such as Halo 3, Valve's Portal, Mass Effect, Crisis, Assassin's Creed, Modern Warfare and the original Witcher. It's safe to say it was a massive year for new IPs and players were thrilled with some new amazing games. But for me Bioshock was one of the games that truly blew me away within this year. This new IP made by the incredible minds at Irrational Games was to give players a brand new take on an FPS. PS game. It was to have a rich, lore-filled, engaging story that was to completely surprise players. It was to have an extremely detailed world set in an underwater city, something that had never really been seen before. And all round it was meant to be an experience that was completely different to its largest competition, Halo 3 and Modern Warfare. I adored Bioshock back in 2007, mainly because I loved the concept behind it combining a film noir style with thriller and horror game. But with the game being over 13 years old, I wanted to really know if it was that classic game that truly blew the world away back in 2007. So I booted the remastered game up, sat down and played all the way through the campaign taking in everything all over again. And safe to say that game that I loved back in the day still amazed me and I actually enjoyed it way more than I did back when it first came out. So in this video I want to talk to you guys about the reasons why I absolutely loved Bioshock and why this game means so much to me. So welcome to Wisefish and this is my review of the forever classic Bioshock. Before I start this video, if you want more content like this, then would you kindly hit that subscribe button for more in-depth reviews of some classic games like this. I've got so many more videos coming up soon, so yeah, if you're not subscribed to the channel, it would be great to have you on board. So if you haven't subbed, would you kindly do that now and hit that notification bell? Anyways, without further ado, let's get on with the video. I'll be completely honest, there have only been a few games in my 20 plus years playing experience that really blew me away and immersed me from the offset. Bioshock was certainly one of those games. The intro to this game still blows me away to this date. The way it literally plunges you into the deep water of you are in a horrifying plane crash instantly shows you that this game is not going to be plain sailing. It's going to put you into places that put you out of your comfort zone and make you question what on earth is going on. After swimming to the lighthouse being guided to you by the flames of your totaled plane, Bioshock does this incredible thing. It sets up all the themes this game is going for and does a great bit of visual storytelling without really saying a single thing through expositional dialogue. As the door closes you are plunged into complete darkness and straight in front of you a huge statue of Andrew Ryan greets you. It's gold plated, it looms above you forcing you to look up at him and the phrase no gods, no kings, only man stands above him. There is nothing else you can see, it literally fills your screen forcing the player to look at it. Within the first few minutes Bioshock has set up this world, it's shown that your silent protagonist is going to plunge into the deepest waters. And this place he has entered is all about the ideology of humankind over everything else. We also learn who our antagonist of the story is going to be focused on, Andrew Ryan, and it also shows us a bit of the hypocrisy of Rapture. Sure the statue says no gods or kings only man, but the fact that it's a singular person's head plated in gold that stands above you forcing you to look up at it shows that this world's ideology is somewhat flawed and in fact Andrew Ryan kind of believes himself to be this god or king of rapture. When in your sphere heading into the depths of the ocean the game sets up what you are stepping foot into. The game beautifully details the world you are about to enter through a voice of your main antagonist Andrew Ryan. He details that this world is going to break away from the ideology of the American dream. He's tired of being limited by governments and their control on creativity. This world was to be set up by the incredible minds of creatives, scientists and intellectuals who wanted to break away from the traditional American society and through this amazing presentation you expect this world to be an intellectual and creative paradise, one where anything is possible. Because of this presentation by Ryan it also shows that Rapture itself is a bubble that this new society created and put themselves in and it served as a test tube for their ideologies and more specifically their newly developed science and vices. You also learn a nice bit about Ryan himself, you learn that he himself is a man who got lucky with his wealth, he values hard work and to be rewarded for that work. He hates the idea of having that stripped away from him and the idea that giving out handouts is a weak mentality. Rapture was the only way for him to live the life that he wanted. 
with that ideology of man and no one else. By the end of the presentation, the screen goes up and then we get that moment that almost everyone who played this game remembers, and that is the plunge into Rapture itself. This introduction to Rapture captured me from the offset. It's such a brilliant way to introduce you into the narrative of Bioshock and the way it sets up all the themes leading up to it. It just shows you how spectacular the writing really is for this game. As you venture through the outside of Rapture, once again, this game makes you feel like this world on the surface or in this case under the surface, is looking like a beautiful idyllic world, one filled full of wonder and no limitations. Neon signs glow up and illuminate the water. Sea creatures swim through the city as if it was their natural habitat. The world just looks amazing, full of life and looks like an underwater paradise, as if it were Atlantis brought to life. The game does a fantastic job at making everything look great. It forces you to think that this world is going to be this utopia that you wanted to live in. But as soon as your bubble docks in the world, you see the truth behind everything. You realize you judge the book by the cover and this utopian world is a dark, barren, horrifying world which is a threat to you from the get-go. I remember when this part happened at the start, I was terrified, even though I kind of knew that I was going to be safe because, you know, it's the start of the game, nothing's actually happened yet. But honestly, this introduction immersed me into the world of Rapture. It told me a story about what is going on and what this world's ideology was based on. And going forward, it was going to allow me to uncover what really was wrong with and what had happened to Rapture. Alright, maybe I and a few loyal fans of the franchise have a rose-tinted outlook on Bioshock and its story, but honestly, playing this game all the way through again, I have got to say Bioshock has to be some of the best writing in a video game that I have ever played, especially in an FPS game. Bioshock is just so original, and I honestly mean that. I cannot think of any other game that even comes close to what this game is like. The whole setting behind it, as I mentioned in the introduction, was unlike any other game. Irrational honestly wanted to put you into a new world, one that no one has ever ventured in before. The characters all have really well-written personalities and standout characteristics. From the super vain and tortured artist Sander Cohen in his eerie artistic world of Fort Frolic, which I'll talk about in a bit, to the city's highly influential founder Andrew Ryan who lives in his luxury well-protected apartment in the richest part of the city. All the way to the more relatable Dr. Tenenbaum who just wants to look after the little girls with magical powers and wants to keep them safe from turning into little sisters. Every person within the game has their own story to tell and they are all unique from the rest but these stories also help define and enrich the world of Rapture. Because of characters like Sander Cohen we get to see how messed up they are mentally and how brutal this society is as he makes wax sculpture art pieces from humans for entertainment. The first boss you encounter, Dr. Steinman, reveals Rapture's outlook on what beauty is. Dr. Steinman through the use of plasmids and just the environment he works in has lost his mind thinking he has to improve everyone's looks believing them to all be ugly. Because this introduction at the start making him the real first boss that we come across, we suddenly get an insight into why some of the freaks look the way they do. We finally learn the story of how people went from the way that we know them to look like to these disgusting abominations. It's also a nice piece of symbolism. It shows that these people have become the embodiments of the worst that society can bear down on its people and the protagonist is the answer to take them down and vanquish these extreme ideologies. From greed to vanity, every level shows off how far this world has fallen and if you want to push the boat out you could say that rapture itself is a form of hell or the forgotten humans left on a disgraced earth where everyone who inhabits it is feeling the wrath of god in this case it's you even the name Rapture itself refers to the section in the Bible which tells of when God takes all the believers up to heaven and leaves the sinners back on earth. You can see there are religious intakes in this story, and you even get that from the dialogue the splices come out with when they venture the world, as they frequently state things like, forgive me lord, and other religious cries. You, o lord, for mammon. And what did it get me, huh? Father! Why have you forsaken me? I'm sorry, Father. I also love how the plasmids, something that is core to the gameplay, tell their own story. We see through all the posters and shops everywhere that plasmids were once a convenient way for people to work and earn their keep in an easier and more spectacular fashion, but with great power 
comes great cost, one being the sanity and well-being of the users and those around them. From the get-go you are given one, you are instantly taken back by how much power it suddenly gives you. Suddenly you are able to shock people as if you were charged with lightning. You can understand how all these people around you have become obsessed with the unyielding power at the palm of their hands, and it helps you understand how they have become the way they are, and why they are so determined to get the little sisters and kill you when they see you. For me, I'm amazed that they turned a gameplay mechanic into a nice piece of storytelling. Plasmids are core to the design of Rapture. They explain what has happened and what has led to this overwhelming destruction of the city and that for me is a great design choice. The pacing of this story is also worth noting. The game isn't dragged out at all. It isn't too quick. It really is perfectly paced from start to finish and by the end when you get that incredible twist it feels all the more satisfying and it really is a beautifully pieced together story that grabbed me from the offset. But during this campaign it's not only the interaction you have with the characters within levels and their dialogue over the radio. The audio logs scattered throughout the game also give you more of an insight into the world of Rapture. They explain more details behind the antagonists you face in the world, they explain the events prior to Rapture's downfall, and they give you points of view on how people view Atlas, Ryan, Fontaine and the other maniacs and freaks that inhabit this world. The great thing about these audio logs are a lot of the crucial ones that help the player understand what is going on are pretty easy to spot. They are in the room where the quest location has taken you. They are in a tight corridor standing out from the rest of the environment with their red light and they are in easy to get to places. Because of this it makes it easier for the player to pick them up and get a nice bit of extra storytelling, allowing them to understand more about their environment and the person they are trying to get to. But if you are more of the explorer type like me and you want to hunt down for more ammo or upgrade materials then you can find more of these audio logs that are much harder to find. These audio logs once again give you more insights into the world once again and some of them are really big hints for what happens later in the game. It's almost as if the game is encouraging you to explore the world to uncover all the lost tapes that help you on your journey. It's like the game is saying would you kindly uncover every personal story that happens within the game. From Ryan's creation of Rapture, the lore behind the Little Sisters, to Dr. Steinman's fall into madness. There is so much storytelling happening throughout the whole game. This isn't necessarily a linear experience told through cinematics or pointless dialogue that is blatant forced down your throat. It's also worth noting that irrational games work with the mindset that instead of placing the player in an out of body experience to give a more cinematic scene, instead allowing the player to be a natural part of what is going on. By allowing these scenes to play out organically without breaking the momentum and keeping you grounded, with the story. Everything within Bioshock is perfectly crafted to flesh out Rapture and help you experience a mind-blowing story set within a completely refreshing location. But with all that said and done, the way Bioshock tells its story doesn't just stop there. With every location you go into, with every room, with every milestone, Bioshock's levels are enhancing that story and are pumping the player full of new themes and ideas that help them to understand the world around them once again, but also help them to identify what exactly is going on within the this part of the game. There are two key levels that for me display how brilliantly executed the level design within Bioshock are and how they enhance the storytelling experience. The first is Dr. Steinman's Medical Pavilion. This level is the first full level you play through that opens up into different rooms and allows you to explore a bit more. When you are first brought into it you are greeted with a poster of Dr. Steinman's work. We know immediately, not through dialogue but by a visual cue, that Steinman works in plastic surgery, making people look the way they want. But straight off that immaculate poster we are greeted with tons of blood on the floor and a medical sign that is lopsided. As we venture through we also see bodies covered in blood but their faces are hidden, either pressed against the floor or tilted down. But then when we get closer to his office we see the portraits of what look to be models covered in blood and completely defaced as well as writing on the floor that is warning about Dr. Steinman. Immediately thanks to these visual images we can tell that Dr. Steinman who was the cosmetic artist and the man who recreated beauty had now defaced everyone who had come to him. We now know that his idea of beauty was not what it used to be and the freaks who inhabit this world are part of his creation. It's also interesting to note that the freaks in Doctor's gowns are very skittish at this level. This one here who was introduced through this amazing Nosferatu silhouette is terrifying. He comes across as big and scary but when you get to him he hides from you and doesn't want you to see him face to face. Granted this is to make you feel weary and uncomfortable but for me it tells you a story about how Rapture and these people view beauty. When he does come out to 
to attack you, he also appears from out of the blue and not really face to face, trying to catch you off guard. The whole setup at Dr. Steinman's medical pavilion tells a story about how this world has lost its beauty. It's not this glamorous world anymore and is, as Dr. Steinman puts it, ugly. I feel like it's no coincidence that this level is right at the beginning, as it almost feels like it is the face of what has happened to Rapture. The second is within Fort Frolic. Ah, that's better. Fort Frolic, for me, is one of the best levels within this game, and many people agree. This level captures the life and personality of one of the more unique antagonists, Sander Cohen. This whole level is based around showing how self-absorbed and obsessed with his art this character is. From the start, he literally hijacks your ride out of here, steals all communication, and forces you to watch his creepy performance. The fact that he takes over all your communications shows to you that he likes the sound of his own voice, and that his should be the only one you need to hear. Not Andrew Ryan's, not Atlas's, only Sander Cohen's. To an evening with Sander Cohen. But then when you finally get into Fort Frolic, it is clear that this place is his domain and almost like his stage. Every room has a performance or a piece of art by Sander Cohen, from the rigged piano that kills his victim, to this plaster cast family sitting at a dinner table, to the extremely terrifying ballet dancers with bags on their heads within the bathroom. And there is also, of course, these guys who are extremely well placed, pointing you into rooms that lead into a weapon upgrade machine. And after you use that, yeah. It's pretty terrifying, but it all adds to the drama which Sander Cohen thrives on. Every audio log within the level is also talking solely about Sander Cohen. There is no other person mentioned within this whole level, only Sander Cohen. You can also tell that he is in complete control and sees this all as a performance by this part here. After you turn in three photos for his quest, he starts playing some classical music. A spotlight also follows you around the room and the splices all have extremely low health. It means that because of the pacing of the encounters, it plays well with the music and it almost feels like you are not fighting splices, but in fact performing a dance for Cohen. This whole level is just packed full of little design choices that show us how sick and twisted Sander Cohen is, and it helps identify him as this forgotten artist who just wants to be loved and praised. Hell, he's even the one and only character who meets you face to face, simply because you appreciated his art and went along with everything he said, which shows you what type of person he actually is. For a more intense look into the world of Fort Frolic and what makes this level the best within Bioshock, you definitely have to check out Mark Brown from Game Master's Toolkit its analysis of it. It really shows you why it's so well made. But with every level, there is just so much visual storytelling going on. They are also so unique from one another and tell their own story when you're in them. But despite all the incredible visual storytelling, the really interesting characters, extra lore from the audio tapes and everything else, there was just no way anyone playing this game for the first time could have anticipated that all famous twist when finally reaching Andrew Ryan himself. I think the twist for me is why I believe Bioshock has some of the best narrative writing within the video game. The subtlety to where the narrative is going is honestly so well done and completely threw me off guard. I'll be honest, whilst it completely threw me off for the first time, going back to it 13 years later, I had forgotten exactly what the twist really was. So when venturing through the game, I had my suspicions of Atlas and remembered that he did something bad near the end. But when it came to uncovering the would you kindly part when facing Ryan, my mind was absolutely blown away. I had forgotten forgotten how ingrained I had become in trying to find Ryan that I missed all those subtle clues. The game completely throws you off and I think this is one of those games that no one could have ever realised this twist was coming and for me it's not even one of those last minute U-turn twists that get you in an M. Night Shyamalan film. This twist made logical sense, it was completely well written into the story and once again it was totally mind blowing. It really felt to me like they came up with a twist and then based the whole thing around that instead of writing the story and then putting a twist right at the end for no apparent reason. But what this twist did was it made me want to keep going back to Bioshock to see if I had missed things along the way. Did I really not hear the would you kindly parts from Atlas? And were there any clues that Atlas really was Fontaine along the way? Bioshock almost encourages you to keep replaying and discovering more and more as you venture through the levels. When replaying this game, I was able to pick up audio tapes that explained the war between Ryan and the mob boss Fontaine and how Fontaine magically disappeared from 
Rapture. I realized that there was really no mention of Atlas at all within all of these audio logs or dialogue with other characters. The only real mention of Atlas was when we finally got to Cohen and he just briefly mentions those two and their battle on your radio. But throughout the whole game I was being told a story of this mob boss Fontaine and looking back now and knowing the basics of storytelling, why else would you mention the character so much without having a reason? Fontaine had to play a part in this overall story instead of just being a background character that added to the lore. And then learning that Atlas actually was Fontaine made so much more sense as they had subconsciously built him up throughout your journey. But there were also audio logs that intrigued me and on the second playthrough were incredible clues to helping you piece together the story and work out the plot. This one here for example is titled Assassin by Anya Andersdotter. This is found within Ryan's office which is the level just before you encounter Ryan himself and the reveal of the plot twist. This audio log is very interesting as it talks about the little sisters mainly but it talks about Ryan's control and then right at the end the audio log ends with so, so am I an assassin? An assassin? Only one way to find out. When replaying the game, this audio tape for me was a real clear clue for the setup that is just around the corner. Whilst it is incredibly subtle and just another audio log on the first playthrough, replaying it the second time, I find it hard to believe that this is just another extra audio log with no links to the twist, especially considering its title and where it is located within the game. But on top of that, there is also the level Fort Frolic, which for me has a very interesting piece of design that tells a narrative again, although it is sadly somewhat flawed. When you get into Fort Frolic, Cohen dismantles all of your communications between you, Atlas and Ryan. But during this part of the quest, Cohen gives you quest steps to kill a few of his protégés and take pictures of them. After he gives you this quest, however, the quest marker does not appear on the screen at all. It doesn't tell you where to go or what to do like it did when Atlas tells you to go and do something. This little feature for me shows that when Atlas tells you to do something through his mind control, the arrow is used as a guide and you must follow it as it lingers on your screen. Whereas when Cohen tells you to do something, you are free to venture and find it on your own accord. This little detail for me was another clue to Atlas's true identity and goal. It's just a bit of a shame that later within the game the quest marker remains part of the design after you've broken your mind control. I think the concept was there during Fort Frolic but sadly because it became part of the game design and it wasn't explained that the quest marker was part of it, it would have been a bit weird if the last few levels had you venturing without it. It probably would have people thinking their game was bugged because their quest marker had stopped appearing. But regardless, I think throughout Bioshock there are so many hints throughout that help you piece together this magnificent plot twist and because this twist is so mind blowing, I feel like it really makes you the player want to keep going back to see if you can really piece together the clues for that full reveal. Suddenly your second playthrough isn't about what happened in Rapture, it's now about trying to find all the clues that explain Atlas's links to Fontaine. That for me is what makes a great plot twist and certainly puts it right up there with some award winning films such as Fight Club, Sixth Sense and Shutter Island. Bioshock still to this day has one of the best plot twists of all time and I love replaying this game to experience it all over again and every Every time I do, I always uncover new things I had never seen or heard before. To end on, I just wanted to quickly talk about the gameplay of Bioshock. Whilst I feel like the game is super dated when it comes to gunplay and how it all feels, I do think this game does something special. Bioshock on the surface is labelled as an FPS game, but for me it has so many elements that could label it as an RPG. When it comes to gunplay, there really is so much choice on how you go about encounters. For example, your arsenal is filled with a variety of weapons. This means the way you go about taking on groups of enemies completely relies on whatever you want to do. The plasmids are all so unique and all play a different part to the gameplay. Fire spreads, meaning that big groups of enemies can be set ablaze in case you are overwhelmed. Electricity is great for enemies in wet areas and against machinery. Enrage causes your enemies to attack each other and freeze, which is a great skill, allows you to easily take down enemies but at a cost of their loot. Having this choice just makes encounters more enjoyable and really allows players to experiment in whatever way they want. There's also the weapon stations and the atom stores. In Bioshock it is impossible to level every single 
single weapon and plasma it up to its full potential. The game forces you to make crucial picks. Do you level up a single weapon with all its upgrades or do you space them out with each gun making them all feel equal to one another? The same applies with Adam. As much as I wanted all the plasmids, I wanted to prioritize my upgrades to things like my health, Eve and leveling up my favorite plasmids like Inferno and Sparks. There is a real sense of choice in this game and for me it feels like it is not only an FPS but more of a game that takes inspiration from a vast array of genres, from RPGs to horrors. It really would be unfair to label Bioshock as just simply a shooter. To end, I also think whilst the choices for the Little Sisters were pretty lame just being a good and bad option by pressing a button, I did love how this game had the good and bad ending. Once again, like with the twist, it encourages players to go back and take a different approach. This also means they can play around with their plasmids and arsenal, and it just makes for a game with an absolute ton of replayability. To summarize, I truly believe Bioshock is a masterpiece of game design. It is a truly unique horror that has taken elements from so many other genres and creates a whole experience that is unlike any other game on the market. Its level design, its vast array of enemies, its storytelling and writing, its atmosphere and its famous twist all just make this game stand out and it really is a testament to how brilliant the minds are at Irrational Games, or were because they don't call themselves that anymore. Bioshock is a beautiful game and I absolutely loved going back and experiencing it all over again. Once again playing an older title now that I am a bit older has just helped me to appreciate it more. I'm able to see things differently that I didn't see 13 years ago and because of that has really matured into a much better game for me. I could literally talk for hours about why I love this game but hopefully this video was engaging enough for you guys to realize why it means a lot to me. But that is why I love Bioshock. But let me know what you think of this game. Do you love it as much as I do? Or did it not resonate with you? Let me know in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching and sorry this video is so long. I just had so much to say about it. If you enjoyed this video and found it somewhat informative then would you kindly leave a like and subscribe to this channel for more videos like this. This took a long time to make but it was extremely enjoyable to make at the same time. I am now playing through Bioshock 2 and Infinite and will be making videos on them really soon. I also want to thank Wow Such Gaming for helping me with some of the script especially when it came to the lore of the game so thank you for helping me there. I'll leave my Patreon, Discord, and Twitter in the description if you want to support me on there. But that is all for now. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you all in the next one. Cheers.